Uh, we, we are in the middle, if you don't know, of an amazing sermon series on the book of Romans. Romans, if you don't know, is Paul, the apostle's letter to the church in Rome. He was writing to the Christian believers, both Gentiles and Jews, who he had never met. And he's writing to give them a teaching of this is what it means to follow Jesus. Um, he was passionate about this, and he wanted to let them know, and he knew some of the issues they were facing, and so he can't wait to share with them and tell them he wants to come and see them as well in person. But he writes them this letter. To catch you up before we begin today, you need to know what happened last week. And at the beginning of chapter 3 last week, Paul makes a couple of big points. The first point he makes is this. God is always faithful. Always. Right? His faithfulness does not depend on our faithfulness. In the midst of our unfaithfulness, God is faithful. We don't change God. God changes us. God is always faithful. But that created an issue among some of the believers because there were people that said, well, wait a minute, if God is always faithful, even when I fail, that means that when I sin, God is able to show his faithfulness even more because I sinned and he remained faithful. So maybe we should sin to point out God's faithfulness, right? You you got this line of logic-ish that they were taking here. And Paul, at the end of last week's text, says, no, absolutely not. We should not sin in order to point out God's faithfulness. Those who say that, they have earned their punishment. So no, you don't do bad just to make God look good, right? Um, you don't, and, and if you like that line of reasoning, don't try it in your marriage, right? Just a little public service announcement. So that's where we left off. God is faithful, but that doesn't give us excuse to sin just to point out God's faithfulness. And so we jump in today with verse 9 of chapter 3 in the book of Romans. And Paul says this, Well then, should we conclude then that Jews are better than others? And why would he say this? Well, I'm sure the Jews who were hearing Paul talk about those who were saying we should sin to make God look better, and the Jews are looking down and going, that's wrong. Clearly, you, you don't understand what it means to be a follower of, of Jesus. And so they were, or others were looking down at some of the other members. And he's saying, look, well then, should we conclude that the Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that how many people? All people, whether they are Gentiles or Jews, are under the power of sin. As the scripture says, now, Paul's about ready to quote scripture. Paul's doing this in a different order than he normally does. If Paul had been talking to a group of primarily Jews, Paul would have started his whole um, treatise with the Bible, with scripture as they knew it, with the law and the prophets. Because to the Jew, that is is how you would have supported what you had to say. You would have gone right to scripture. Paul in Rome is talking primarily to an audience of Gentiles. And so Paul has presented his argument to them already. But now he is reinforcing it with scripture. And what he is doing wasn't uncommon in the day. They would take a number of the a number of texts that supported what they had to say and kind of stack them together like proof texts. And this was their, their defense for what they were saying. And so Paul here has a whole stack of, of texts that he has combined together from the book of Psalms with a text from Ecclesiastes and another from Isaiah thrown in as well. And so he turns to Scripture to support the fact that all, whether Jew or Gentile, are sinners. And Paul, as he quotes, he says, No one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise, No one is seeking God. No one. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. Their talk is foul. Now he changes. First he said, this is the condition you are in. Let me show you that you are all unrighteous. Now he enters into some verses where he's going to show specifically how their unrighteousness plays out in their life. And when I say them, I mean us. Because he said, how many? All of us. And so Paul said this, their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. That's not good. Their tongues are filled, not recommended. Their tongues are filled with lies. Um, Snake venom drips from their lips. Have you ever heard words that sound that way? I don't like it. I've had that look given to me before. I don't like that either, right? (laughs) Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. And then he says, look, here's the root of all your problem. They have no fear of God at all. 
This is bad. In fact, let's just be honest. It's not just bad. This is depressing. When Tim asked me to speak, I said, sure, he's, I'm going to be gone. Would you speak on this date? Um, it sounds like Pastor Terry and I have similar stories. We, we need to check with Tim before we just willy-nilly start accepting things. You know, I said, well, sure, what's the text? He goes, well, here it is. Once you're committed, you don't back out, which I wouldn't have. But you read the text, and I read it the first time, and I thought, I got the depressing one. <laughs> I mean, this... <laughs> This is sad. I mean, where's the, good, where's the good news that preaches in this, right? And for those of you who analyze people and how they think, you're welcome. Don't tell me what you come up with right now. But for some reason, in reading this once, I kind of heard the voice of Eeyore from, you know, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Don't worry about me, Pooh. I'll be fine, right? <laughs> uh, I, and I was reading it, and then this is what I hear. It says, well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. (laughs) All the scriptures say no one is righteous, not even one. This is depressing. (laughs) How do you preach depressing and make it good, right? Um, I thought, okay, I, and wait, okay, wait, 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 do you hear Tim's text next week when he comes back? I got Eeyore, he got Tigger. That text will preach, all right? So thanks, Tim. Thank you. And you're welcome. I'm here today. Um, No, it was depressing. And when I looked at it, though, and then as I read it a few times, all of a sudden it flipped on me. The reality of this text flipped. And I read it different. Um, Have you ever had your perspective of reality just flipped upside down on you? I mean, just totally turned upside down? I just realized all of you who like Stranger Things are like, oh yeah, upside down, I totally get that. Um, but it's almost like that, right? Your, your reality that you think, all of a sudden something happens and your whole perspective of upside down, it goes upside down on you. It just, it flips. Um, maybe this is, it, well, if you have this, maybe this has happened with a significant other, shall we say. Um, you were very, very sure and convicted of what you believed and the perspective that you were presenting in your discussion that you were having. And as you presented your perspective in your discussion and you were so convinced of how you were more right than they were, at some point, your significant other makes a very salient point. In fact, what they say is so revolutionary to the way you thought, it's like suddenly a switch has been flipped on. And everything you were thinking got just turned around. In fact, you you turn and say, mate, so what you're saying is this. Yes, and, and, I, and, and so what you meant is this, yes. And then you think to yourself, what was my position again? <laughs> because what they have said completely reorients your sense of reality. I, uh, yes, uh, you're right, I've never had that happen to me either, so I know we don't understand that. But for the two of us who may have experienced that, you understand. This happened actually to our family a few months ago. Um, <clears throat> turns out my family are dog people. And when I say my family, I mean my wife and my younger daughter. Now, being a dog, any dog people here? Let's see if you know. All right. All right. Now, let's see. Now, you know being a dog person does not simply mean you like dogs. Right? We like dogs. I've always liked dogs. Right? From the time, from the time my littlest one, Shawnee, with the time she was, could talk, we'd say, what do you want for your birthday? What do you want for Christmas? A puppy. Right? She loved dogs. Um, you know what she got? Not a puppy. It got so bad that at the point when she turned about 10 or 11 years old, we'd say, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want for your birthday? She goes, well, what I really want, I know I can't have a puppy. Yeah, she's good. So we have a puppy now. But being dog people does not come from owning a dog. We've had our dog for three years. That, just because you have a dog, you're not dog people, I've discovered. This is how you know you're a dog person. When you start finding lost dogs. My sister-in-law finds lost dogs. But it's interesting. She only finds yellow labs and and yellow retrievers, golden retrievers. I'm serious. Um, Which leads me to another theory I'll have in just a moment. I'm not actually sure that when you're a dog person, you find dogs. I kind of think they find you. I think there's some kind of underground railroad list for dogs that if they leave home, it's like, okay, these are the lists of people you should find. Find them. In fact, I'm not even sure these are lost dogs. I kind of think they just leave, right? 
Because you notice when you find a lost dog, does it ever have a collar? No. You know why? Because they take it off like a cheap promise ring. Done with you people. And then they leave. <laughs> they don't, no, they don't have them. And so you, so anyway, we started finding dogs about a year ago. And I say we, I mean my wife and my daughter. I was never in the car when they found dogs. I was always home when they arrived, but I was never there when they found the dogs. And so one day we were, had a big afternoon planned after church. And so I was here and I had to stay longer, of course, being one of the pastors here. Um, and by the way, I apologize. If I haven't met you, I'm Pastor Tom. I get to be the junior high pastor here. My wife and I just realized we've been here this summer for six years. That's crazy. <laughs> Love this place. This is home. Well, we were, we were leaving after church. I had to stick around a little longer. My wife and my daughter jump in the car and head home. As I'm about ready to leave church, I get a call. Honey, don't kill us. We found a dog. We rescued a dog. Of course you did. Rescued a dog. Um, now, let me explain what our afternoon was. We had planned. We were getting together with some friends we hadn't seen in a while, and we were going to have a lovely lunch at the dog park with their horse. Um, well, they say it's a Weimaraner hound, but I'm pretty sure it came with a saddle because <laughs> those things are huge. And we were supposed to have this lovely lunch, so we did. Our friends, their horse, us, our dog, and the one we rescued. Uh, this dog spent a lovely after Sabbath afternoon with us, with our friends in the dog park, having a, lo a fabulous time, great food. It, it, was, it was in heaven. Well, afterwards, we're in the car. My wife says, look, this is what happened. We were coming home couple blocks away, right there in the middle of the street, on the corner, there, this little dog was there, and, and Shawnee saw it and said, Mom, stop. <clears throat> and so we stopped the car and we got out. But evidently the dog wasn't sure this were people on the list, and so it kind of went up the street, up a couple yards, and as they kind of followed it, you know, just kind of calling to it, come here, you don't be in the street. Well, it went up about three yards, and then my wife said, and it kind of went through a gate, through a fence into some people's courtyard in front of their house. And it kind of just stayed there and we couldn't get it. But the gate was kind of open, so she said, I went in and I called it over and it came over and we picked it up. <laughs> and we checked, no one, was, no one was home, but we checked some other places and no one, no one answered or they said it wasn't our dog. They didn't, they'd never seen the dog before. And so, and so we took it. I said, well, that's, that's great. Didn't have a collar, didn't have a chip. We, we, we went to the vet that day. We, we were servants. We were doing the work of God that day and being kind and doing what we should. No, no chip. On the way home from the park, she said, you know, we should check one more time. Maybe somebody's out in one of the front yards. Sure enough, a family's outside playing. And we walk up to them, or actually we don't, we drive up to them. My wife um, gets out of the car with our daughter and the dog and says, have you seen this dog? And I start seeing nodding heads and pointing arms. And I think, oh, great. So my wife kind of says, Go like this. And so I, I'm being in the stalker car. I, I'm following along on the street. And, and they go a few doors down. And they go knock on the door. And nobody answers. And so the, they take the dog and they toss it over the back. Well, not really toss. Um, the, the neighbor kind of climbed up on the fence, took the dog, and kindly placed it in the backyard. And my wife got in the car and she says, yeah, he said that the people over here, they had some, some friends come to visit and they brought a dog with them and the dog had gotten lost and they couldn't find it. Um, and she goes, the funny thing is, that's the house where we got the dog from inside the courtyard. <laughs> that was when my reality flipped. And I realized, honey, we aren't dog rescuers. We stole that dog. We're, we're, we're not Christian examples in the community. We're nothing but petty dog thieves. <laughs> the owner wasn't home, so that was your dog. Wherever you, I'm sorry. It had a lovely time. We fed it. We wanted to give it a bath, but we found you first. So, um, Not that it was dirty. It was a lovely dog. Um, yeah, your reality completely flips, and suddenly what you thought you knew, it's not what you knew. For me in this, as I was reading it, it's depressing. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God, right? None of us is righteous. Not, we, we're all unrighteous. And it was when I read those texts, and it says no one is righteous, that it, all of a sudden a light switch went on and it hit me different. Because another way of saying no one is righteous is just saying that all are unrighteous. And all means all of us. See, when you read it at first, it's, 
you read it often is, I'm not righteous. I'm not righteous, and it's almost like I'm alone in this. It's, it's just me. How, look at everybody else that seems to be doing so much better. I, I'm not righteous, right? Look how bad we are. Look how bad I am. And yet, Paul's not saying that. Paul is saying, no, all. And all means all of you and me. All of us are unrighteous. That means we're not against each other in this. That means we're together in this. That means we aren't on our own. That means we walk this together. And when Paul said that, Paul levels the playing field. Paul levels the playing field, which is exactly what he intended to do. Paul cut the legs off the chair of superiority that anybody wanted to stand on to be able to look down and say, yes, because I am, I am better. Because you are, I am better. And Paul willfully, purposely cuts the legs off every one of those superiority chairs and says, no, we are all the same. We are all unrighteous, all of us. None of us are any better than anybody else in the sight of God. We are all sinners. And what you find when you grasp that reality is some freedom. And I would say there's freedom in three different ways that Paul offers us when we grasp this text. The first one is this. We have freedom from perfection. We have freedom from perfection. And if you have ever suffered from a need to always be perfect, or you are now, you know that's a freedom you could use. We live in a community that is a very, very high-functioning community. You look around, I don't know if you know this, people don't accidentally become doctors. It doesn't happen that way, right? You don't accidentally become any kind of professional. You have to choose. You have to be purposeful in your choices. You, you function at a high level. You choose to work hard. You choose to make things happen. Um, we are a very high-functioning. High I full-time teach Bible at Loma Linda Academy in the junior high. I absolutely love it. But when my first year of teaching, I realized that I was no longer going to offer A-pluses in my class. Because I would have students who missed one or two points in the class, went all the way from an A-plus to a regular A. And they would argue with me for half an hour as to how they could possibly get that one or two points back so they could have the A-plus. So I just didn't offer A-pluses. I haven't offered them in 21 years now. Um, I don't offer A-pluses anymore. People don't have an argument. Um, right? Because now they have as high as you can get. And you can miss a lot of points and still get that. But how often do we live our lives trying to figure out how we can get that last point because anything less than perfect isn't enough. That's stifling. I mean, it's one thing when you're absolutely just compelled all the time to have to be perfect because you are sure that in the sight of, of God, you're, you're not good enough. In the sight of your family, you're not good enough. In the sight of the people you care about, you're not good enough. In the sight of the community, you're not good enough, good enough. Or in your own sight, you're not good enough. And you feel compelled, I have to be perfect. Versus somebody who chooses to be the best they can be. Doesn't that feel different? And there's something about our spirituality that as humans, we, we head towards we got to be perfect. Hey, if we could be perfect, that would be fantastic, right? Doing what's right is a great thing. Paul's not saying you all are unrighteous. That's great. That's what you should be. He's, he's saying, no, we don't want to be unrighteous, but the reality is, is that you are. So find some freedom in that. You're not perfect and you're not going to be. You need something else instead. Perhaps another way of saying this is oppression versus living. Oppression versus living. It's interesting our double standard we have on this. Um, any baseball fans here? Baseball fans? I love baseball. Yeah, I grew up with baseball, watching my dad play in the fast pitch softball leagues around. <clears throat> when you are measuring how good a player is in the individual stats, one of the major stats you want to know is what is their batting average, right? What is the batting average of this player? How how often do they get on base for every time they come up to bat? Did you know that in the whole history of Major League Baseball, if you take all the players through all the history, the best players in the world, in the best league in the world, you know what the, the average batting average is in Major League Baseball? Under 280. Under 28%. Under 28%. That means all the best batters in the world, if you took them together, they would get a hit less than three, out, three times out of every 10. That, not so good. In fact, if they get a batting average of 350, we're like, that's fantastic. 400, that's unheard of. If you, if you could average 500 just getting a hit half the time, you could write your own paycheck, right? That would be unbelievable. And yet, how do we look at people if they get it right with Christ half the time? How do we look at ourselves? 
We cheer these Major League Baseball players on, woohoo, you're horrible, right? 30%, that's bad, that's way, in my class, you get a low F at 30%. Okay, that's a bad F. You have to work for 30%, right? And we cheer them on. Why is our double standard like that? Look, we, we are not going to get to be a thousand batting average. We're not going to. We need something more. The second freedom Paul gives us is this, freedom from comparison and judgment. And I'm purposely using those two different words because they're two sides of the same story. Comparison is when you're always looking up at everybody else. Look at them. I could never be that good. What would it take for me to be as good as them? The, oh, I'm just, I'm never going to measure up. Judgment is then always looking down. Look at how much better I am than them. That makes me feel better. Look, I may be this, but they are that. <laughs> and clearly that is worse than this, right? And it frees us from both of those. As Pastor Tim said about four weeks ago, it frees us from judgment. It frees us because Paul just leveled the playing field. And if the playing field is level, who's judging who? We acknowledge we're all in the same mess together here, right? We all have a problem that needs a solution. And I have no reason to be judging you. And I can learn from you, but I don't have to hold you up as the highest in esteem. I need something more than all of us. Right? Another way to say it, there's a couple ways. One would be competition versus equality. It's easy for us to get this idea of, well, I need to be better. If somehow if I'm better than you, then I'm better. As opposed to saying, rather than who's better, maybe we're equal. Right. And that puts us in a different place to function as community, which takes us to the next one. Rather than judgment, we find community. Rather than looking down, we realize we're all together. We can, we can join arms together in the midst of our failure and say we need each other to support each other, to cheer each other on because we are all fellow, tr fellow travelers on our journey home and we need each other. Very different place and Paul frees us from that. To get to the third, play, the third way that Paul frees us, we need to read our last two verses that we have, 19 and 20 in, in Romans chapter 3. And Paul says this, Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given. And whom was the law and the prophets originally given? <clears throat> the Jews. So to any of the Jews who may have been feeling like they were better, he says, well, obviously the law and the prophets apply to you. The law applies to you for its purpose is to keep people from having what? Excuses. Or other versions say, you have nothing left to say. You know you're guilty. And to show that the entire world is guilty before God. We're all guilty. One more time. Let's establish that. The law was given, but it shows that we're all guilty before God. So what's the, what's the law good for if it's not going to save us? Well, it says, for no one can for no one can ever be made right with God. How? By doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. You thought the first part was depressing. The law just shows you how sinful you are. It can't, no one can be saved by the law. It just shows you how sinful you are. So clearly then, the law, as good as it is, let's not get this wrong, the law is good. The law shows us how to live in a way that shows love to God and love to others. The law shows us how God calls us to live the best life. But the law doesn't save us. But that's where my text ends. The end. Let's pray. All right, that's not enough. Tim, I'm not sure what you were thinking about ending there. Because that's not enough, right? I'm going to do something really mean right now. Oh, well, we'll come back to this. I'm going to do something really mean. Um, try to be quiet as soon as I do this. Just stay silent. Dun, da, da, dun, dun. <laughs> Not listening. Yeah, we can't do it, right? What do you have to do? You have to finish that. Dun, da, da, dun, 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 right? It, it's like this text. It, it, someone just went in the text. Paul just went, dun, da, da, dun, dun. And he's expecting for us to go to the next verse, which is, dun, dun, right? We can't leave it here. That's, that's not right. So, Tim, I'm taking one of your verses. Because Paul never intended for us to end right here. I'm not alone in this. Right now in my junior high, um, Richard Davison is teaching for me. He's one of our teachers at Loman Academy. And, and he actually texts me this week and he goes, um, do I have to end with verse 20? Or can I just do one more verse in there, right? Because it's not meant to end here. Paul never intended it. If the law is not enough, we have to know then, well, then what, Right? It's like, it's like building, it's like a movie that has a couple that get through all the adversities, they keep trying to get to each other, they finally find each other, they meet face to face, and the credits roll. No one goes to that movie. That's horrible. So before the credits roll, we need to know what it is. And so we skip from verse 21, we go to verse 22. And Paul says, 
If the law is not enough, then what is? We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this, and this is true for everyone who, who believes, no matter who we are. Jew and Gentile, slave or free, anybody, everybody's been leveled out. It's a level playing field. What you need is Jesus. He's the only way. And that changes how we live, doesn't it? We are freed in Jesus. And what, that's the freedom that Paul gives us. The answer is Jesus. Now we have freedom in Jesus. The focus is now off ourselves. You realize when we're trying to be perfect all the time, where's our focus? Us. When we're comparing ourselves to everybody else, where's our focus? Us. When you find freedom in Jesus and realize he's the only one that's enough, where's your focus? It's on Jesus. And that changes your world. It changes your life. Now you're free to love because your eyes aren't on yourself all the time. You're free to truly live. Well, which is what I would say it is, right? The focus is off of yourself. It's, if you go to the next one, put it up, there you go. Um, it's requirement versus response. Requirement versus response. Think about if you had the most, a spouse that was the most perfect spouse you could possibly imagine. It's like they, they, they knew everything that you were hoping for, everything you wanted. They, they were always one step ahead of you. They, were, they treated you so well. They were always so kind. They, they supplied all of your needs. Everything was one step ahead. And finally, one day, you just, you're just so overwhelmed. You say, you are such an amazing spouse. Why do you do all these amazing things for me? Why are you so good to me? And they say, because I'm afraid that if I don't, you'll leave me. That just changed the whole conversation, didn't it? What have you said to them? Why, why do you do all these amazing things for them? They said, because I love you so much it compels me. Are we living for God because we're afraid he's going to leave us? Or do we live for God because our love for, his love for us and our love for him compels us? That's what he wants. Harry A. Ironside was a great preacher and evangelist of the 20th century. And there was a three-year period where he just flew through the ranks of the Salvation Army. He was, he was reaching people. He was preaching. In fact, it got to the point where he was preaching over 500 sermons a year. He was preaching all over the world, but there was this nagging doubt that kept going after him. There was doubt that he wasn't good enough, that he wasn't enough, that he had backslidden, he had fallen out of God's grace and God's favor, that he wasn't the person he had to be in order to be saved. And he heard these other preachers and other people speaking about how they had achieved righteousness and how they had learned to be better and better, and he felt himself just falling away from God. And he was working, it just it overtook him, it overwhelmed him, it consumed him to become better and better so that he could reach perfect righteousness and someday to be able to be be good enough for God. It got so bad that he had to finally check himself into a rest home to recover. He did that at the age of 18. He had already worn himself out and burned himself out trying to be enough for God. It was only then that he realized we can't save ourselves. Only God can save us. And when Harry Ironside came to that realization, it changed his entire life. And he was able then to step into 50 years of ministry, transforming people's lives, preaching to the world, preaching to thousands of people, being one of the pillars of the Christian faith in the 20th century. And it all came because he learned that it wasn't him that was enough, it's Jesus. And it was because of that realization that Harry Ironside was able to write these amazing words. And he said this, you see, it is not Christ and good works, nor Christ and the church that save. It is not Christ and doing our best or Christ and the Lord's Supper that will give us new life. It is Christ alone. Amen. And he goes on to say my favorite words. He says, Christ and is a perverted gospel, which is no gospel at all. Christ without the and is the sinner's hope and the saint's confidence. Jesus is not only necessary, but Jesus is enough. Amen. If you've come into this place today and you don't feel like you're enough, congratulations, welcome home. Because no one else in here is and we know it. But we know the one who is. And because of that, we lock arms together as we walk on our journey home. And we keep our eyes on Jesus. And we tell the world, we love you because Jesus is enough. Let's pray. Almighty God, you and you alone are enough. 
Jesus, you did the unthinkable so that we could have the unbelievable. You, you have given us what we could never have hoped for, never have earned, never deserved, what we worked so hard for and just have failed every single time. But Lord, because we have it from you, you've given us freedom. Freedom to keep our eyes on you. Freedom to truly love without limits, without bounds, without strings attached, because that's how you have loved us. And to follow you with all of our hearts, because we don't follow you so that you will want us. We follow you because you've already loved us. And may we love you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.